This is Bound for Glory, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by Garrett Kiesel. Chapter 1 We live the way they let us. Is that even really living? Sure, life on this alien space station is all I've ever known, but I still know it's not right. I still know it's not natural. I still know it's not good for us. Most importantly of all, I know it's not something I can put up with for much longer. We live under the control of the Anzorians, an alien race who brought humans to their world before I was born. None of us know exactly what happened. We don't know if the Anzorians conquered Earth in a violent invasion, or if they just abducted a few thousand people and left the rest as they were. Hell, we're so far away, we don't even know if Earth is still there. I've seen enough alien technology to believe these guys could destroy a planet if they wanted to. And Earth is so much smaller than their home world of Anzoria that it would probably be an insignificant task for them. I definitely feel like we are insignificant in their eyes. Really. I have no idea why they brought us here to treat us the way they do. They boss us around and use the luckiest of us as servants. If that sounds weird, it's only because I haven't told you yet what they do to the unlucky ones. Ever since I was old enough to understand our situation here on the Exelon B station, I've dreamed of finding a way to set things right. A way to set us free. I hate this life. But this isn't just about me. All of my friends are in the same boat too, and my dad has been in it for a whole lot longer. Living as servants to the ruling Anzorians is no life for anyone, and it kills me to wake up every day and see broken looks on the faces of everyone I care about. I'll put it as simply as I can. Life on Exelon B just plain sucks. But for the first time ever, I think there might be a way out. Might. Pay attention to that word, because the odds are stacked so firmly against me that I don't think I'd share my plan with anyone else even if I could. I can't, naturally, because the aliens have surveillance systems picking up every word we utter. But like I said, I wouldn't mention the details of this to anyone even if I could. I know what would happen. Dad and my friends would all say it was crazy. They'd say I was crazy. They would probably do everything they could to talk me out of taking such a huge risk with such a low likelihood of paying off. Maybe if the plan wasn't so new, I'd even have talked myself out of it. But it was only two days ago that a call from the station commanders turned my life upside down. The plan only popped into my mind then, because the one-off opportunity everything it rests upon only arose then. The time frame couldn't be tighter. Today is the biggest day of my life so far, and it's going to be my last day on the station. This realization is rattling in my mind, as I step out of bed and look at myself in the mirror. Whatever happens, I think this is the second to last time I'll ever be waking up here. Two days ago, in an instant, everything changed. And when tomorrow comes, one way or another, things are going to change even more. My name is Chad Mitchell. I'm 17 years old and I was born into alien tyranny on the space station Exelon B. Tomorrow night, one of two things is going to happen. I'm going to break free, or I'm going to die trying.
Chapter 2 Okay, hold up. I didn't expect this. When I'm making my bed before heading out to start the day, my hand feels something inside the pillowcase. I know my room is under full surveillance, just like everyone else's, so I do all I can to play it cool. But I know what my hand has stumbled upon here. It's a piece of paper. No two ways about it. Someone has planted a note. This has long been established as the only way we can communicate with each other about delicate things that we can't risk being overheard by the aliens. The people tasked with keeping the station clean, housekeepers basically, whose work is just as unpaid as everyone else's, also fulfill another role that the aliens don't know about. In short, they're secret messengers. If I wanted to send a message to my friend Carl, for example, I'd slyly sneak a piece of paper from somewhere like the bathroom or the school hall, and I'd write a short note. I'd do that in bed, under the covers where the cameras can't see, and I'd leave the note inside my pillowcase. The cleaners always check for notes, and if they find one, they sneak it into their pocket until they can just as carefully sneak it into the intended recipient's pillow. I didn't feel anything last night because it's a small piece of paper, and it's a once or twice a year kind of deal to get a note. So much has been on my mind, I didn't even check. I always make my bed to give the cleaners less work to do, so they only have to touch it on the days designated for a change of sheets, and that's why I felt it this morning. Notes are usually important. Each one has to be, since everyone understands the risks for themselves as the writer and also for the messenger who delivers it. But how am I supposed to read it without being seen? Usually, I'd read it under the covers, but I can hardly get back into bed right now without looking suspicious. Where the hell is it? I groan. All for show. My next move is to crouch to the floor and look under the bed. I then start angrily unmaking my bed and pretend to keep looking for... I don't know. Whatever I'm pretending to look for. With my covers now messily covering the edge of my pillow, I reach a hand in and grab the note. I push it to the back of the bed and climb on pretending to look down the side for something that might be stuck between the frame and the wall. I pull the note under my stomach and glance down. What the hell? It's folded closed. More than that, it's sealed closed. There are three words scrawled on the outside. Chad's eyes only. Whatever this is, the sender didn't just want to keep it from the aliens. He wanted to keep it from the messenger. Fair play to the messenger for going along with that, I say, but I know why they were willing to do it. All notes are important, like I said, but this one isn't from just anyone. I haven't seen this handwriting all that many times, but I remember it very well from the few times I have. The writing is my dad's and there's clearly something private that he needs me to know. I try not to dally, because every second will make me look more suspicious if anyone ever looks at the camera feed from my room. Normally, that would feel like a long shot, but the unusual amount of attentions the aliens have been paying me lately changes the equation. I unseal the note as quickly as I can without damaging it too much, and the words I see inside make my eyes widen like grapefruits. I know you're flying out. I also know there are security flaws. I can get surveillance video from the control room when they're distracted, just before you leave. I'll rush to the dock to say goodbye. That's when you take it. Chad, forget your mission. Just take the footage where it needs to go. 
Whatever it takes, do it. I believe in you. I gulp and slide it back under my pillow before making the bed again and pretending to look for something in my drawers. My dad has conveyed so much in so few words. My head is positively reeling. He somehow knows the aliens have picked me as the pilot for a small repair job on the far side of the station's exterior. Probably from a note someone else sent to him. But this new information about obtaining security footage? That's a bona fide game changer. Here I was worrying that he'd think I was crazy if he knew my plan. And he's been thinking the same thing with an extra layer on top. The situation as it stands is that I'm scheduled to perform my mission tomorrow night, and the plan I've had in mind is to fly to another station, Exelon C, instead of flying to the far side of this one like I'm supposed to. I'll need to explain some context for this to make sense, and I'll get to that. But for now, the crux is that I want to reach the others to tell them our commanders have gone crazy with power and are mistreating us to the point that multiple people have tried to kill themselves. For their troubles, those people have won an even worse life under constant observation in prison cells. I know that because my dad works as a janitor, and sometimes works on maintenance jobs in the high-security prison area. He told me all of this in a note last year imploring me to be extra careful to stay on the commander's good side, given how rough the conditions were for those who didn't. I guess his janitorial work is how he knows security footage is stored in the control room and thinks he can sneak in to get it. And if I can deliver footage of how bad things have gotten here, rather than mere testimony of it, my long-shot plan is going to have more of a chance than if my own father wasn't also willing to take such a colossal risk. I believe in him as much as he believes in me, so now I feel like my task is to make it through the next day and a half without the commanders changing their collective mind to send me over any of our other top student pilots. Boron is sold on me as the best choice, but I get the sense that Sturjo has his doubts. Right now, I feel both better and worse about the plan than I did a few minutes ago. If my dad pulls off his part, my part has a much greater chance of success. But if he gets caught, we're probably both going down. But like I said, I believe in him. He's never steered me wrong, and he's never let me down. I give up my fake hunt for absolutely nothing and curse a few words under my breath, still for show. My heart is pounding, and I know that the stakes couldn't be higher. I need to make absolutely sure the commanders stick with me as their pilot of choice. Otherwise, my dad's risk is going to be all for nothing. Until I read this note, flying out of here tomorrow felt like an overdue chance at freedom. But now? Now it's my only chance. It won't take long for the aliens to realize someone has stolen the footage, and if I don't get it off the station while I can, it's never getting off, and neither are we. Whatever it takes, I'm going to make sure I'll be the one climbing into that spacecraft. I might have to swallow my pride and actively ingratiate myself to Sturjo, but that doesn't feel like much of a price to pay compared to the alternatives. I already said that this isn't just about me, but all of a sudden, that feels truer than ever. My father has just thrown himself neck deep into a plan that only I can see through. I can't let him down. I won't let him down. Only I can do this. And just like my dad wrote in the note, I have to do this. Whatever it takes. Chapter 3 
I know what's in line for my last full day on the station. A whole lot of last-minute flight training and running over emergency procedures in case something goes wrong with the mission. To be clear about one thing, so you understand it as well as I do, Sturjo and Boron don't care one bit about anything that might happen to me. They're sending me to repair the minor problem on the station exterior because it's a risky job. I feel like the chimps that humans sent into space back in our days on Earth, when we were taking our own first steps towards space travel. Dad learned some history like that from his parents when he was young growing up inside the old Exelon base on the surface of Anzoria. He passed it on to me here, in the days before every word we say was recorded to be poured over by Sturjo, Boron, and their attentive underlings. I was young when life on the station turned in that oppressive direction, just old enough to remember things changing, but too young to recall the details of what happened when. I know it was after we lost my mother to an illness, because I remember candid conversations that some people and even some aliens had with my dad about their belief that the commanders could have done more to help her, like send her down to the surface for better care. If they'd said anything critical like that after the cameras came in, they would have been locked up before they knew it. A lot of my bitterness towards the commanders comes from their inaction back then, and I see that in my dad's eyes too. He despises them even more than I do, which is a lot, and I don't blame him. I wasn't old enough to take it all in, and it still stings like a finger in a raw wound so I don't even know how he keeps a level head when he has to look at Sturjo and Boron. Mercifully, I suppose, that's not very often, since the commanders spend almost all of their time on the far more luxurious side of our ring-shaped station. I'd never been into any of the restricted zones until they called me in to discuss my mission a few days ago, which was really a case of them telling me what I was going to do, rather than asking if I was up for it. The decadence of their closed-off spaces gave me one more reason to hate them. What with how much it all contrasts with the side of the station that us commoners call home. Saying my bedroom and our dining areas are Spartan would be far too kind. It's another case of that feeling when, even though I've never known anything else, I just know it's not right. There's no reason for us to live with as little comfort as we do. There's certainly no reason for our hallway floors to have been cold, exposed metal ever since a janitor, but not my dad, accidentally spilled some paint. The commander spitefully removed the padded flooring from every corridor in our quarters. That's a small example, but it gives you an idea of what they're like. I'm pondering all of this as I walk through the flight training center. I've been doing fast-track training for a few years now. Until they gave me this mission, I didn't really know why they were training us. My dad always said our stay on this station would be temporary, and I used to believe him. We thought the eight different orbital stations the aliens built were maybe for getting a better understanding of humans, to see how we fare in different conditions or something like that. It's frustrating to know so little about why you are where you are, but that's the life we have. For my dad... I think this is even more frustrating than it is for me, since it's not the only life he's ever known. Like I already said in passing, he wasn't born here. He and my mother were both born inside the original Exelon base. It was a base rather than a station, because it was on the surface of Anzoria. Although my dad said life was better there, he never got to go outside 
or even to see out of a window in the decade and a half before he was shipped off to this place. His first sight of Anzoria came when he reached this station, Exelon B, which is one of the eight I mentioned a minute ago. The human population of the original base was split between the eight new stations, along with a bunch of aliens chosen by their ultimate leader, Emperor Nebrion, who was always referred to simply as the Emperor. The Emperor appointed two commanders to each station, and my dad once said that even as a kid, he remembers feeling sick to his stomach when he realized he was going to the station where Sturjo and Boron would be in charge. He said those two were always less friendly than the rest, some of whom treated him pretty well, apparently. But they were still nowhere near as tyrannical back then as they've become in the decades since. Like everything else I know about the past, Dad told me all of this in the days before our station surveillance systems were ramped up to their current oppressive level. Oppressive is one adjective that fits. Others that work just as well would be pervasive, intrusive, and damn near total. If we talked about anything like that now, we'd get caught. Hence the notes in the pillowcases. No one takes any risks, because when people around here get caught doing something they're not supposed to, well, they disappear. Because my dad's role here is being a janitor for the aliens, he's had to do maintenance around the prison cells where rule breakers go with seemingly no possibility of ever getting out. If they were definitely never getting out, I figure they'd be executed. So for a long time, I've thought that Sturjo and Boron probably don't have absolutely free reign over how to run their station. Killing human subjects might be the ultimate no-no in the Emperor's eyes, for all we know, and I guess the prison makes sense in that context. Disappearings don't happen often because everyone knows better than to step out of line, but it happens just often enough to make sure that we all keep knowing better. Sturjo and Boron are tyrants who love nothing better than setting unjust rules and making examples of anyone who breaks them. And we all know that. The crux of the plan, which my dad has improved with the part he's going to play, rests upon something I only believe because of him. The idea that Sturjo and Boron, rather than the Anzorians as a whole, are specifically tyrannical. When it comes down to it, though, I can't be sure that the commanders of the other stations aren't even worse than our two. All of the ring-shaped stations, unimaginatively named Exelon A through Exelon H, orbit Enzoria. And as much as we'd like to, we don't have the faintest idea what their purposes are or even what's going on inside them. My dad's childhood memories paint the Emperor as a benevolent and maybe even a good individual. The thing I don't understand about that is why a good Emperor would appoint bad station commanders and give them total control over our lives. But really, all I can do is trust my dad's memory and trust his gut. He's the one who is on the surface right until he was just a little bit younger than I am now. He remembers seeing the Emperor in person, and even talking to him. He says human children on the base were educated more fully than they are here, and that the Emperor himself handed out awards to the hardest-working students every year. The education was all scientific and empirical stuff. No real mention of history and no mention of Earth. Just like none of my alien teachers ever taught me any of that. He won the top award in the last two years before the stations were complete. And he vividly remembers the Emperor telling him that big things could be in his future. Those big things turned out to be working as a janitor on Exelon B, 
and that's one more element I can't really reconcile in my mind. If Sturjo and Boron are worse than the other commanders, and if this station is worse than the others, why was a promising student sent here and not somewhere else? I don't know. Maybe there is a key difference between being recognized as a hard-working student and a promising student. Like I said, I've been fast-tracked as a promising pilot for a long time. Not that it's ever brought any benefits in how the commanders treat me, but our teachers only ever praise progress, not effort. When someone in class says they're trying their hardest, the reply is always something along the lines of, if you were doing the right things, these simulations would be easy, or we don't care how hard you work, just work better. They really are as explicit as that about it. I haven't told you much about the aliens themselves, but the main things to know are that they are physically similar to us in general terms, and they can also speak aloud in our language. A skill that has improved greatly over time, according to stories my dad was told by the first generation of humans who were taken from Earth. The Anzorians speak a different language when they talk to each other, and needless to say, we have no idea what they're saying when they do. Anyways, yeah, when I was young, my dad looked me in the eye and promised it wouldn't always be like this, because not all of the aliens were like Sturjo and Boron. Under their command, this station hasn't been a great place to grow up. But I don't even want to think about how bad it would have been without my dad. He's always kept me safe, and I really feel like I don't have any choice other than to trust his instinct on that. I take a deep breath as I approach the door to the training center. The flight simulator is waiting for me, and I won't be surprised to see Sturjo and Boron too. Given the level of personal interest they've both taken in making sure I'm ready for the repair mission. As soon as the door opens, I inhale sharply and fight to keep a straight face. The commanders are here, but that's not what's bothering me. No. What's bothering me is that the simulator is already occupied. I see my friend Reggie on the other side of the glass panel and I don't like what that implies. Every training statistic shows that he's the second best pilot here, miles ahead of everyone else and only a little bit behind me. I'm hoping they have him here for a last-minute training as a stand-in in case I fall ill or something, but that doesn't seem likely. No, as much as it pains me to say it, I think Sturjo is trying to change Boron's mind. I thought you were set on me flying out, I say to Boron, addressing him in a tone I regret as soon as the words leave my mouth. What's going on? Sturjo, his even less personable partner, answers in his throaty but clear manner of human speech. Boron was set on you. But I'm not. I hold the alien's beady eyes, which are one of the features that vary from ours more than most others. Their bodies resemble ours more closely than their faces do. That's for sure. I'm the best candidate, I say. Whatever trials Reggie is running and whatever emergency scenarios you're throwing at him, I'll beat them. This is an important mission, and I'm the best man for the job. Sturjo looks at me pensively. Actions speak louder than words, he says, just as the simulator stops moving and Reggie steps out. Now, your turn. Well, here it is. I was worried that Sturjo was undecided, and I sure as hell wasn't wrong. At least it's in my own hands, I figure. They're going to make an objective decision, 
and Reggie has just finished posting his numbers. To make sure I can follow through on the plan I've come up with, whatever its ultimate merits, I first of all have to prove my worth over another very capable pilot. I can hardly hear myself think over the sound of my heart thumping as I step towards the simulator. No pressure. Chapter 4 It's yours if you want it, Reggie whispers as we pass each other. He whispers it very quietly when we are at our closest point, turning his head in a way that made it as unlikely as possible for the commanders to notice. I don't know what he means until I get into the simulator capsule and see that the numbers he's posted are mediocre at best. Now I get it. He doesn't want to go. He knows the flight is dangerous due to the unusually tiny landing area we have to hit to perform the repair, which is why the commanders are sending an expendable human pilot instead of one of our far more experienced alien trainers. Reggie hasn't posted terrible numbers for his reaction times and speedruns. That would have been obvious, given how good he usually is but this is nothing close to his best. This calms me down instantly and makes it a lot easier to perform close to my best. I quickly get into the zone, feeling the flow of things, and I blitz past Reggie's numbers in every field. An hour or so later, I finish up, stepping out and walk over to Sturgio. I'm the best candidate, I say, and nothing else. He doesn't reply. Boron, always slightly less unfriendly, if not exactly cordial himself, extends a hand for me to shake. You're in. The alien announces, in that grating voice they both have. Sturgio and I agree. You are the best candidate. We'll run over some emergency procedures, and then you can gather your things. You will dine and rest in our quarters tonight, young Chad. Upon your return from the mission, your bravery will be recognized with a permanent move. But this is a dangerous mission, where safe return is far from guaranteed. So we want to ensure you can enjoy at least one nice night as thanks for your sacrifice. Recognizing my bravery is one thing but I don't like this phrasing of thanking me for my sacrifice. Maybe that's Boron trying to be nice. Who knows? But sending me on a mission he thinks is so dangerous hardly speaks to a caring nature. Besides, I'm not going to be landing in the tiny area where the commanders want me to perform a repair. Sure, what I'm going to do tomorrow is extremely risky but they don't even know the half of it. Chapter 5 Everyone knows I've been spending time with Sturjo and Boron in the last few days. That's not the kind of thing that stays quiet, given how rarely they personally engage with any of us humans. And I think it's been the lower-ranked alien workers who spilled the beans. I've had a lot of dirty looks from people I consider good friends. I guess they see me as a sellout or something. But they don't know what's really going on. Most of them don't know about the important mission I'm being prepped for. And none of them know about the surprise I'm going to pull on the commanders when I get behind the controls of a real spacecraft for the first time. The few hours of final emergency training I do in the simulator are straightforward enough, and so are the operating instructions I get for the radio. Sturjo and Boron will be in constant communication with me, they reveal. I gulp at first, but then come to think this isn't really a bad thing. They're going to see me veer off course anyway, 
so at least this way I can relay some kind of excuse to prevent them from sending someone after me until I'm far enough away to evade them. Once I return to my room and gathered my things like Boron asked, I get some really dirty looks in the hallway. Moving up the ladder? My friend Carl asks, the sellout implication of his tone unmissable. I don't say anything and just keep walking. It's horrible to feel the eyes of your friends looking at you in the way they all are right now. But they don't know what they don't know. It's not like I blame them either. In their shoes, I'd probably be acting the same way. When this is all said and done, I definitely won't have any hard feelings. These are the people I care about, and they're the very people I'm going to give my all to liberate from Sturjo and Boron's needlessly oppressive control. I keep my head down until I reach the threshold of the station's most exclusive area of all, the Central Restricted Zone. The CRZ guard who is waiting for me quickly touches a door which slides upwards, an odd thing to see, and in doing so he clears my path into a whole new world. The difference is so stark, it's almost hard to believe. The floor on our side of the door is the exposed metal I mentioned earlier, while the floor on their side is padded so much that I feel like I'm walking on a cloud as soon as I step across the threshold. Even before the paint spill, ours was never like this. The walls are warmly painted too, and even the overhead lighting is far more pleasant than the sterile cool white we have to deal with. I've never seen another kind of lighting outside of the restricted zones, even in the training room, and it's another one of the ways they could have made our lives more comfortable with almost no extra effort. Boron appears from a doorway quite far down the corridor and steps out to direct me towards my room for the night. He thinks I'll move there for good if the mission is a success, but he doesn't know that our ideas of a successful outcome tomorrow are rather different. I'm going to spend one night in this new bedroom. One night and no more. If things go well for me, things are going to change around here. Sturjo and Boron will no longer be in charge. If things don't go well in one way or another, well... The commanders aren't exactly going to keep this reward on the table. The bedroom I step into is leagues more decadent than mine, and even than the hallway. The bed is enormous, and it's softer than my hands can believe. I lay down to find that the whole thing is softer than my body can believe, too. Light years away from the hard mattress and thin sheets I've known until now. So this is how the other side lives, I think to myself. I'm one of the very lucky ones here, in that I've been recognized as a good pilot. That's meant that my days are spent in the training center, rather than cleaning up after others or slaving away in the Anzorian's kitchen. My good buddy Carl is a server in their grand dining room, and he falls into bed exhausted every night. He's never complained about how easy I have it in comparison, but I think that played a part in how frustrated he got when he saw me moving out of my room. He's one of the few humans who cross into the restricted zones for work every day, so he's known how the Anzorians live and he's always had that stark comparison between their world and his own. Like I said earlier, I knew our conditions were poor even though I had nothing to compare them to, whereas guys like Dad and Carl have seen how things could be, whether in this part of the station or on the old base down on Anzoria itself. Boron tells me to make myself at home until the banquet in a few hours. 
I unpack everything, playing along as though I'm expecting to be here for more than one night. But since I don't have much stuff, this takes all of a few minutes rather than hours. I sit down on the bed when I'm done, and within a few more minutes, sitting turns to lying down. I guess with how soft the bed is, it's no surprise that the next thing I hear is a knock on the door. I jump up and open it. Were you asleep, young Chad? Oran asks. I can hardly lie. Not when they've probably got cameras in here. I say probably because I don't know for sure that they'll have surveillance in this zone's bedrooms. What with how selective they are about who gets to live here. But it's not worth the risk. Uh, yeah. I stammer. It's a big mission. I want to be completely rested and ready to do exactly what you need. Good. Very good. He replies. But along with rest you must eat, young Chad. Follow me. I do. As if I have any kind of choice. And a few minutes later, I'm walking through another door into by far the most opulent surroundings I've ever seen. The hallway was one thing, and the bedroom was something else. But this? I don't even know where to start. As the minutes go on, it gets more and more incredible. One thing I've never felt was too bad around here is the food. But damn, I didn't even know what food was. We eat okay-tasting, mushy stuff out of packets and cans. But these guys, these privileged Anzorians, they eat stuff I've never seen before. And it all tastes like heaven. And don't even get me going on what they eat on. The table is a thing of beauty in its own right, and it's set with white plates and bowls that are shined up so nicely, I can practically see my reflection. Oh, and the nice warm lights that impressed me earlier? Literally nothing compared to what's hanging on the ceiling above the table. It's called a chandelier, and I only know that because I asked Boron. Speaking of Boron, until a few days ago, I quietly hated both him and Sturjo. I thought they were two peas in a pod. Two cheeks of the same you-know-what. He's been a lot nicer to me than Sturjo has, though, and I came into this banquet thinking maybe he's not so bad. Well, talk about misjudging a character. It seems pretty bad that he sits me down between himself and Sturjo then doesn't just neglect to introduce me to any of the other dozen aliens, but proceeds to talk in their language all through the meal, literally talking over my head and leaning behind my back. But as time passes, it gets worse than that. The only time Boron speaks in our language at the table is when the human servers return ahead of our main course. One of them is my friend, Carl, who looks at me like I've just walked on his pillow in dirty shoes. He doesn't have to say anything for his feelings to be clear. Again, I can see where he's coming from. If I saw one of my friends rubbing shoulders with our oppressors like this and didn't know it was for a good cause, my disappointment and resentment levels would be off the charts just like his seem to be. When Carl reaches to take Boron's first empty plate, he accidentally knocks a perilously balanced knife to the floor. This leads Boron to jump to his feet and explode at Carl with words I don't want to relay. It's not even a rebuke. It's a full-out verbal attack, with serious threats thrown in for good measure. Carl is dismissed for the night and warned that his punishment isn't over. He looks at me again, 
but this time not in anger that I've seemingly sold out. This time, he looks broken, and like he's silently asking me to speak up. He maybe thinks I have more sway with these guys than I do. Chad? He eventually says, the words weaker than any I've ever heard from him. Suddenly, everyone is looking at me. I feel the stares from Boron and Sturjo most intently, and not just because they're closest to me. Sure, I'm all set for the mission tomorrow, but I still can't shake the feeling that my position might not be a whole lot stabler than the ill-balanced knife that just caused all of this. One wrong move, and I could fall out of favor, out of their circle of trust. Well? Sturjo gruffly demands in my direction. It's the first word he's spoken in our language all night, and it's loaded with pressure. My heart aches, and my eyes scream out my apologies. But there's only one thing to do. You heard him! I snap at Carl. Get the hell out! Carl's shoulders drop even further than they already had, and there's no time to see how his expression changes before he turns and sulks away. All around me I hear hollers of amusement, and then I feel a firm double pat on my back. One of us! Sturjo beams extending a hand for me to shake. I feel dirtier than I thought a person could ever feel, but I have to keep the charade going. For one more day, I have to play the game. Thank you, I say, shaking his hand as the rest of the aliens look on approvingly. As I sit down, Sturjo looks at Boron. You chose well he says, speaking deliberately in words I can understand. He is the one. I bite my tongue and fake my smiles as the meal continues, now included in the conversations as they take place in my language. If I can keep Carl's dejected face out of my mind, I'll sleep well tonight, I figure, because Sturjo is right. I am the one. The one who's going to end their reign of tyranny, once and for all. Chapter 6 When I said I would sleep well, I didn't know how right I was. I don't know if it's the bed or all of the rich food and drink, but I don't think I've ever slept so long in my life. Today is the biggest day of my life, with stakes I can hardly even comprehend. But all I can think about as my eyes slowly open is the way Carl looked to me for help. I wish I could have given him some kind of signal that I haven't sold out, and that this is all part of a plan to help everyone in a bigger way than they could imagine right now. Some firm knocking on the door shakes it away for a moment, and I realize that it's a continuation of the knock that first woke me up. The door then opens, taking me by surprise, and even less expectedly, I see a human walk in. Oh, I'm so sorry, she says. I didn't realize you were still here. It's Tammy a girl only a few years older than me who works as a cleaner. I know her pretty well and didn't know she worked in the zone, but I guess they're sworn to secrecy about that kind of thing. Do you want me to make the bed? She asks. I shake my head. Don't worry about it. Her gaze intensifies. It's really no trouble, she says raising her eyebrows in a way that's barely perceptible. Oh, now I get it. There's a message. She wants to leave a note, and the only way to do it is via the well-established pillowcase method. 
Fine, I say, indifferently. I'm going to the bathroom, so just hurry up and be gone before I get back. I like Tammy a lot, and I hope she knows I'm treating her like this in case the commanders are watching. Just like with Carl, I'm consoling myself with the hope that it'll all be worth it and that she'll forgive me when my plan pays off. She's gone when I get back, like I requested. You want something done right, you have to do it yourself. I grumble loudly as I walk towards the bed. It's not even straight. I'm talking to myself, for the benefit of any prying aliens, in an effort to justify the fact that I'm about to reach into a pillowcase on a perfectly made bed to look for a small piece of paper. It's there, as I expect, and this time the note isn't folded or sealed. It contains only five words. Rear waistband when we hug. Devoid of context, this would mean nothing. But you've probably clicked as quickly as I have. It's from my dad. And he's telling me where I'll find the storage medium containing the station surveillance data. I don't know what shape it will be or how large, but at least I know where I'll find it. Chad? A gruff voice calls from behind. I can't tell which one of them it is since they sound the same, but I know it's one of the commanders. I turn quickly to see Boron, who I no longer hold in any higher regard than Sturjo. That doesn't make much difference, because I suddenly have a huge problem on my hands. At the shock of the voice and with the speed of my instinctive turn, my hands knocked something from the bed, just as Carl knocked a knife from the table last night. I could have just landed myself something much worse than a public humiliation, though, because I didn't drop an innocuous knife to the floor. No, I dropped a covertly smuggled note. A million thoughts run through my mind at once. They'll trace Tammy's movements on the surveillance cameras, I figure, checking every room she's been in today. They'll know it's from my dad, and they'll know that he and I are planning something. This note is clearly an addition to an existing communication, and they're bound to look back through my recent surveillance footage to see me behaving suspiciously yesterday when I was pretending to look for something in my old bed. So many people could be caught up in a retrospective investigation into the covert messaging system we've been using for so long. So many people could be in serious trouble because of me. Unless... Unless what? Unless I do something that's going to amplify the stress and dangers of the plan even more. Unless I do the only thing I can think of doing to possibly save it, when it seems like doing nothing isn't an option. I don't know what I'm doing, but here goes nothing. I'm doing it. Boron, I tried to talk him out of it. I say. I couldn't do it, so I let him think I'll play along. His plan depends on me, and if I didn't let him think I would do it, he might have done it himself. Boron steps forward, his face heavy with confusion. Talk who out of what? He asks. Young Chad, what is going on here? It's never been so hard to force words out of my mouth than it is right now. But I think of what's at stake today. Bigger than any one individual, for sure. And I finally managed to say something to the imposing alien who stands before me. Someone is trying to take down the station, I tell him. I don't know who it is, but he believes there is a device in the control room that can disable the lighting system and allow him to do whatever his sick plan calls for, unseen. He wants me to hit the switch just before I take off later today, when everyone is distracted, so he wants to give me the device. Naturally, I won't do what he wants, but I saw securing the device as the only way of ensuring it doesn't get into the wrong hands. I also think that if they think anything is wrong, for instance, that I might have told you something, they will take other measures. 
I'm telling you now, Boron, with hesitation, but I really think it should stay between us. We can take care of it. And if we're the only two who knows, then there's no chance of a leak. I think there may be some untrustworthy colleagues in your ranks. What device? Boron blasts. There is no such thing. And what untrustworthy colleagues? And Zorians? You speak of disloyal and Zorians? I shrug. Don't shoot the messenger, Boron, but lower your voice before they hear. And listen, why don't we catch him out? Then we'll know who it is. Take me to the control room a little while before the launch time. If the Anzorian traitor shows up and I'm there, he might explain everything to me. He might confess it all, thinking I'm on his side, and then you'll have him. Hmm. You are wise for one so young, young Chad, the alien says. I don't know why Boron always calls me young Chad, but that's hardly the important thing to focus on right now. I also don't know what I've just done, but I still feel like I had to do it. If I hadn't done something way out there, like this, the whole thing would have fallen apart. Now that I have them worried that something is going on with a weird device and an unknown plotter, I'm hoping I'll be able to seize the surveillance footage myself. That's why I thought of the part about them taking me to the control room, to be there when the plotter arrives. After this, security is going to be stepped up way too high for my dad to have a chance of sneaking in unseen. That plan wasn't viable anymore, so if I want that footage, I need to get it myself. It's a case of adapt or die, and when this is all said and done, I'd like to think that my dad will congratulate me for the quick thinking. He's also a senior janitor with legitimate access to the privileged zone. So his entering the control room isn't going to be an obvious sign of any wrongdoing in itself. Especially if I can speak first and tell him the plan has changed without actually telling him the plan has changed, or by implicating him in it in any way there's a chance I could slyly get the footage without him getting into any trouble. It's a risk, sure, but no more of a risk than letting the plan run as first intended now that Boron has found the note. Before he leaves, the commander crouches to pick it up. He reads the words, which is apparently effortless despite our languages once having been so alien to his kind as theirs still is to us then hands the piece of paper back to me. Your willingness to assist in this matter is exemplary, young Chad. He says. And it stays between us? I ask. I will take you to the control room as you request. Voron says. The disloyal Anzorian who taints our station will pay for this. I almost smile reflexively. If his mind is set on the plotter being an alien, my dad stopping by, with the reasonable excuse of janitorial work, might really not cause any problems. The distraction, meanwhile, might be just what we need to get the footage in time for me to take it where it needs to go, as his first note put it. This is all getting more complicated than I would have liked, but we're almost there. Wherever we're going to end up, we're almost there. Chapter 7 I don't want to count any chickens just yet, but I think young Chad really has outsmarted one of our station commanders. Boron hasn't told Sturjo about our talk earlier. I know that for sure because Sturjo hasn't mentioned it, and Boron made up a reason to talk to me privately when it came time for our control room visit. Between that talk and now, I've done some more last-minute flight training. Sturjo spent some of that time merrily recalling the embarrassment Boron and I heaped on poor Carl last night, 
and every passing minute with these commanders really does further strengthen my resolve to bring them down. Dad's recollections of life on the original Exelon base involve aliens with attitudes and behaviors so far from Sturjo and Boron, none more so than the apparently benevolent Emperor himself, that I'm growing surer and surer that power really has corrupted these two into what they've become. If I can successfully deliver proof to other Anzorians of what's happening here, particularly conditions in the prison cells, but also the general treatment of human subjects within what we all still think is supposed to be some kind of research station, well, hopefully I can put an end to all of this. Could other station commanders be worse? I doubt it, but you never know. Could my dad's memories be hazy? Or could the Emperor have changed for the worse in the intervening decades? Maybe. Could this whole plan take us out of the frying pan and into the fire? Who knows? But I'll tell you what I do know. I'm sick of living in a damn frying pan. And that's not the life I want for my friends or my dad either. I don't think I'm being cavalier to think this is worth a shot. Because things here hardly seem worth preserving. I could strike out. No two ways about it. But I have to take this swing. When we get close to the control room, Boron gives me the code so he doesn't have to come into sight of the door. He wants to stay unseen, to make sure the alien traitor he's expecting won't see him. My dad couldn't save a few steps by giving me the code in a message because until now, I've had no excusable reason to be in the control room, or even near it. He does, on the other hand, and his back-breaking janitorial work might just end up being our saving grace. I enter the code and step into the control room, trying to act cool. The fact that Boron is going along with this without telling Sturjo makes me think no one is watching the security footage, or else the commanders would surely be alerted to such an unexpected entry as this. There's bound to be surveillance in here. There literally has to be. But if no one is watching it live, then maybe I don't really have all that much to worry about. While still playing it cool, I look around with increasing urgency in a bid to find whatever kind of device contains the footage Dad is planning to give me. There's writing on signs and various notices everywhere, but I can't make sense of any of it. I see a screen that's displaying various security camera feeds, and I follow a very thin metal cable, which is connected to screen at one end, and a small black box at the other. This has to be it, I figure. But do I take the whole box? Is there something removable I can take from inside it? Just as I inch forward for a closer look, I see movement on one of the feeds. It's my dad. He's almost here. I take a deep breath. When he arrives... I'm going to tell him I'll have to come back later for whatever work he's doing, because right now, I'm helping the commanders to take care of an emergency. My heart is pounding like never before as I see him approach. Hopefully, he'll realize that I'm in control here. Hopefully, the fact I'm in the normally off-limits control room, where he just told me we can get a crucial piece of evidence, will be enough of a sign for him. Another glance at the screen tells me I don't have long to find out. I close my eyes and step towards the door. I think about opening it to talk to him in the hallway, but decide to wait until he's inside, just in case that takes him out of Boron's earshot and slightly reduces the heat of the fire I'm playing with. He has a metal pail in his hand, with a pair of rubber gloves hanging over the edge which makes it look like he's working. Smart. He's clearly thinking straight, which is a good sign. A few seconds later, I hear him punching a code onto the security screen. 
he has this code legitimately, so Boron shouldn't be alarmed by his presence or his entry. Dad! I say, pretending to be a lot more surprised than I am. His eyes widen immediately, and he stops dead in the doorway. No need for pretending on his side of things. Can you come back later to do whatever you're doing? I ask. I'm trying to help the command. You need to leave. He snaps. Chad, this isn't the plan. No, 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 no. Dad, be quiet. And then I hear Boron's voice. My spine stiffens. Because it's too late. He has heard everything. The game is up. Chapter 8 Plan! Boron booms in Dad's direction. It was you? You're the traitor? Boron's footsteps sound almost as loud as his voice as he approaches, but Dad doesn't turn to face him. His eyes are locked on mine, and mine on his. It was you? I shriek. Dad, no. Say it isn't so. Please, say it isn't so. As my father stares into my eyes, I give the subtlest wink I can just before Boron arrives behind him. I see the realization on my father's face. He finally knows I'm on top of things, or at least thinks I am, and he breathes what looks like a deep sigh of relief. It can't be you, I say, laying it on thick as Boron arrives. My own father. It can't be. I'm sorry, son, he says. I didn't mean to get you involved in any of this. Boron is here now. He takes hold of my dad's hands, pulling them behind his back to detain him, probably until a security guard can arrive with some cuffs. Chad? Boron says, looking at me over his new detainee's shoulder. My dad, meanwhile, raises his eyebrows, urging me to say something else. Mom would be rolling in her grave if she saw what you've become. I spit. Boron, take him away. I hate saying these words more than any I've ever uttered, even though he has to know I don't mean them. Unseen by the alien, my dad smiles for half a second clearly approving of my decisive words. I'm sorry this has happened, Boron says to me. But once again, young Chad, you have impressed me greatly. I force a nod. Just don't hurt him, okay? He's still my father. I won't be able to focus if I think someone is hurting him. As you wish, the alien replies. At least until your important mission is complete. We'll place him in a cell without interrogation. I don't like the temporary nature of this promise. But if things go well, then no one besides maybe Boron and Sturjo themselves are going to be in a cell when my mission is complete. When they leave, I hurry to the box and feel around with no further care for discretion. If anyone is watching this footage, I'm screwed anyway, so why waste time being careful? Within a few seconds, I find a thin card-like piece of metal that looks kind of like a computer chip I've seen in science books. There's no way I can smuggle the whole box into my spacecraft without being noticed, and this does look like some kind of storage medium, so I stick it in my waistband. Irony at its best and get the hell out of there. I stop in the doorway, where something on the floor captures my attention. It's another piece of paper, one which Dad must have dropped on purpose just before Boron seized him. I waste no time in glancing at it, and boy am I glad to have found it. For once, it's not a note. No, this time, it's a photograph. 
It's an old one, too. Probably from around 30 years ago, with a resemblance no one could deny. And if what my dad has told me about the emperor still holds true, the content in this photo and the resemblance it throws up could both be majorly helpful in what I'm trying to do. Worried I'll be seen, I stick the photo beside the storage card without letting my eyes linger anymore. There will be time for that, I tell myself, and that time is almost here. I set off, as quickly as I think I can move without looking suspicious if anyone sees. As it goes, I've only taken 15 or 20 steps when I hear Boron calling from behind me. Wait! He demands, and it is a demand, not a request. I gulp, but I clearly have no other option than to do what he says. He reaches me in no time, with my father nowhere to be seen. A guard is taking him to a holding cell, the commander relays. Under explicit instructions to be gentle. With the gravity of his actions and the possibility of collaborators in our midst, that may not be an order I can maintain for long. But as I promised, he will not be harmed while you are engaging in the mission. And afterwards, can I talk to him before you do anything? I ask. Again, there is no scenario where I come back and things stay as they are, so this question is moot. I'm just trying to say what I think an unsuspicious person would say in these circumstances. I think that will be for the best, Boron says. He may talk more candidly to you. Young Chad, I cannot imagine the betrayal you feel. I felt sick at the thought of a fellow and Zorian plodding against the station. But for you, the culprit is not merely a fellow human. He is your own flesh and blood. I sigh heavily. It hurts, I reply. But the more we talk about this, the harder it's going to be for me to refocus. I have an important mission, Boron, and I understand the launch window for leaving tonight is narrow. Placing a firm hand on my back, Boron encourages me to start walking. We are lucky to have you, young Chad, he says. You keep thinking that, I muse. You just keep on thinking that. Chapter 9 I might only be 17, but I've racked up thousands of hours of simulated flight time. The Anzorians picked me out as a promising candidate pilot before I even knew what a pilot was. Based on the early years' tests they did on things like reaction times and calmness in the face of unexpected stimuli. Even still, as soon as I get into a real spacecraft for the first time, I feel majorly unprepared. The pressure suit feels heavier, even though I know it's not and my seating pod feels way smaller than I'm used to. I know these differences are all in my head, but try telling that to my heart rate. The only sticking point is the tight landing. Boron says from the bottom of the ladder I just climbed to get in. And your teachers tell me that landings have always been one of your strongest skills. We're in the station's dock joined by only Sturjo and the most senior alien flight technicians. Needless to say, I'm the only human in sight. It's true that I've always felt comfortable with simulated landings, and that I mastered that side of things long before any of my peers. But really, I'm not even thinking about the landing. Why would I be? I'm not going to the tight landing zone. I'm not even going to the other side of the station. I'm doing what Dad's first note implored me to do and taking this footage where it needs to go. I was already going there even before Dad stepped in with his part of the plan. 
but the surveillance footage that I hope is on the storage card makes me more confident than I would be without it. That card is still wedged inside my waistband, slightly painfully now that my pressure suit is adding another layer of tightness, but an hour or so of discomfort is a small price to pay for the lifetime of freedom this plan could secure. It will be hours rather than minutes, of course, because I'm not making the very short flight to the other side of the station. I'm not even making the slightly longer flight to one of the stations on either side of us, Exelon A or Exelon C. No. My sights are set further afield than that. The aliens run me through everything one last time, checking that I know what I'm supposed to do, and I nod and agree like a good little pilot. I didn't lie either, because I do know what I'm supposed to do. I'm just not going to do it. I'll level with you here. When the countdown begins and reality sinks in, I feel a huge weight on my shoulders. My heart is heavy too, knowing that Dad is in jail because of this plan, and that his only chance of getting out is for everything to go right. Thinking about him in that cell puts my own temporary situation in this small spacecraft into perspective. Sure, this space is smaller, but I'm not going to be in it for long. I hold my breath as the clock reaches two seconds until showtime. This is what it's all about, I tell myself. The course is set in my mind, and the destination awaits. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to do what has to be done. I force out a breath and psych myself up for the challenge ahead. Nothing can faze me now, because I'm Chad Mitchell, and I am bound for glory. Chapter 10 When the clock hits zero and the dock releases my craft, I'm off without a hitch. There's naturally no need for a vertical launch when we're already in space, and I take off more like a bullet being fired. Right away, I dive into the riskiest part of my plan. I'm losing stability! I yell into the radio, as convincing as I can while I shake the controls just enough to shake the craft while it's still accelerating. I then start to pull away from the station parallel path I'm supposed to follow. This is one thing I've never been able to practice, because doing so under the watchful eyes of my teachers would have been just about the most suspicious thing I could do. But I've paid attention during simulated exercises when I was tasked with writing an unsteady trajectory and I suppose I'm now just pretty much doing the opposite of what worked. Be careful! Boron booms. I think it's Boron anyway. Him and Sturjo sound pretty much the same, but he's the more likely to be concerned for me. As I continue to bear away from the station, and indeed away from the steady orbits of the other stations, I announce that my control system is shot. When a voice comes back to say that their station-based systems don't show any malfunctions, I loudly retort that my hands are feeling it whether their data is picking it up or not. I'm losing everything! I say, doing my best attempt at a frightened voice. Okay, I am frightened, but I'm trying to make sure it sounds like the right kind of frightened, if that makes sense. I'm trying to sound worried for my immediate safety inside this craft, rather than the success of my next ambitious move. Where are you going, young Chad? Boron asks. Yeah, it's definitely Boron. He always calls me that. Listen to me. Just abort. Abort! We'll launch again tomorrow in another craft. If you can only force yourself one way... Keep forcing all the way back around and return to us. We'll open the crash hatch to bring you in, 
It might be bumpy, but she'll make it. Down, I pant, even more exaggerated concern in my tone this time. Guys, I'm going down. I'm in a spin I can't write. Is there a landing spot on the surface? The surface? Oron asks. Other voices are audible now, all just as perplexed. I don't say anything for a few seconds, deliberately staying quiet and slowly stabilizing my craft on a trajectory for Anzoria. Okay, it's not responding properly, but I think I can just about direct myself to a safe area if there's somewhere big enough to land. I say, acting as much as possible like I hate this idea but reluctantly feel like it's my only shot. I can release the inflation lander if you know a spot. This time, they're all silent for several seconds. Hit the most open and flat space you can see, young Chad. Boron eventually replies. We'll call it in so they're expecting you, and a rescue crew will arrive as soon as possible. From their flight base? I ask. From here, Boron says. Damn, that's not what I wanted to hear. If I land in the middle of nowhere and a team from the station comes to get me, the footage isn't going to reach anyone. I'll reach Enzoria, but for what? The point isn't to get the damning footage onto the right planet, it's to get it in front of the right eyes. But really, what can I say? I can't argue. Thank you, is all I say. No one replies. It stays like this for around 40 long minutes until I get word that a rescue crew are being deployed from the station. Already? This is even worse than I thought. We called ahead, too, Boron says. Don't worry, young Chad. They know you're going to come in and land in the planes. I thank Boron again, but that's where he's wrong. I'm not landing in the planes not when a crew is already following in my path. No, I have one chance to do this, and even if it's not the way I wanted it to go, I have to take an even bigger chance than I was already planning. When I get close enough to the Anzorian surface that distance turns to altitude, I level out from my rapid descent. These crafts are incredible, and I know the controls like the back of my hand so the deceleration process is no real challenge. Anywhere there, Boron says. Those wide open spaces. I say nothing, and for the rest of the journey, I'll keep on saying nothing. I leave my radio on so I can hear them, in case something important comes up, but all I hear are increasingly aggressive orders to land immediately. It's only a few minutes until I start seeing signs of habitation on the surface. Our station's orbit holds us steady over the same part of the planet, so I've never seen any of Anzoria besides the lifeless desert. Here, though, here I can see what looks like a city. Best of all, not too far up ahead, I can see a huge fortification that has to be the Imperial Palace. My goal was to land somewhere close enough to some planet-dwelling aliens to make sure I reached them before anyone from the station reached me. I'm here to blow the whistle on what's going on in there in the reasonable hope, given to me by my father, that our station commander's superiors won't be happy to hear it. But if I can skip the middlemen and get myself close enough to the palace to make an audience with the Emperor possible, especially with the photograph in my pocket. Young Chad, please. Boron begs. Really, he's begging. They're not going to allow you to get much closer before. And then it happens. The voice cuts off. But that's not all. My vision cuts off at the same moment, right when I feel the rushing of air as the spacecraft's outer shell all but implodes on impact. I feel nothing, until I do. My right side somehow takes the brunt of it, 
but everything aches. Boron was right. The natives didn't let me get much closer. When I got too close to the palace for their liking, they shot me out of the damn sky. All of a sudden, I hear a blaring alarm and realize that my senses are returning right alongside my pain receptors. After a loss of consciousness, I can only hope was brief. I still have my seat, and intact pieces of the shell give a modicum of protection from the force of air rushing by, but I'm falling without control, for real this time, and I'm desperately counting on the safety gear to kick in. I smash my hands on the inflation button, but nothing is reacting. The panel is shattered, and it really is all down to the automated systems. To my unending relief, I hear the unmistakable sound of the inflation lander popping out. Even better, it's holding air. It survived the impact, like it's supposed to, thanks to its position in the inner shell. I'm not quite going to land within the palace walls, but it could hardly be closer. No more than a minute after the emergency gear kicks in, which it's programmed to do when it senses the craft's altitude has dipped below a critical point without being corrected by the pilot, I'm on the ground. Let's just say it's not a comfortable touchdown, but I make it down alive and with all of my major bones still in one piece. My right hip and right ankle are seriously screaming in pain, but I would have settled for that when I was hurtling towards the ground. A crowd has already gathered, and I really am amazed by how close I made it to the imposing gate that leads to the Imperial Palace. Even once I was hit, I kept falling towards it, which kind of makes me think I was shot by a surface-to-air missile that was further from the palace than I was, rather than any defensive system inside the fortress itself. In any case, the spacecraft and emergency landing system created by Enzorians has survived a missile impact delivered by the Enzorians, and I have that to thank for my life. The gathered crowd is maybe 30 or 40 strong, and more are coming from a tall tower nearby. But then the ones who are still approaching me suddenly stop, and the ones who are already here gaze beyond me. I turn to follow their gaze and see the gate opening, revealing something that's clearly important enough to take their attention away from a spacecraft that just fell out of the sky. And that's when I see what they're looking at. That's when I see him. Unmistakable from the countless portraits in the station, and recognizable from a much older picture I've seen even more recently. There he is. Emperor Nebrion, ultimate leader of the Enzorian race. He steps forward purposefully, heading straight for my damaged spacecraft with an extremely displeased expression on his face. Well, Chad, I muse, I guess you got what you wished for. Chapter 11 I'm hurt, believe that, but I'm strong enough to get myself out of the craft. I figure that's a better thing to do than wait to be carried out, even if I couldn't really explain why, and I grimace through the pain as I unbuckle myself and open the door. First things first, it is warm down here. It's warmer than any part of the station, which surprises me and it's a lot warmer than I expected. That thought comes and goes in a millisecond, though, because the Emperor has walked even closer while I was getting out. What's the meaning of this? He asks. The crowd around him, all native and Zorians, gasp as one. It must be their surprise that he can speak my language which makes me think they probably can't. I was going to suggest talking in private, but I guess that doesn't matter now if no one else can understand us anyway. 
You have to see this, I say, pulling the storage card from my rear waistband. Fortunately, it's in one piece when I lift it out, which wasn't something I'd even considered, but now seems like a stroke of good fortune. Once again, I feel gratitude to whoever designed the craft and its safety features. See what? The Emperor booms. His voice is less grating than those of Sturjo or Boron, as though he's more practiced despite not living with any humans. He's considerably larger than them, too, taller by a full head. So maybe there's also something physically different in his throat or mouth that enables him to better replicate our speech patterns. I don't know why you brought us here in the first place, and I don't know why you built eight stations to house us on. I begin. I take a deep breath and continue. But I don't think it was so Sturjo and Boron can treat us like animals and revel in breaking our spirits. The Emperor's expression doesn't change so much as his whole head tilts back to study me, but at least he's reacting. I have proof of how they run things. I don't know if I should be asking you why you allow them to, or if you're going to tell me that the power you gave them has gone to their heads. Either way, I want you to see what they're doing to us in your name. Still, he says nothing. People are locked in cages for trivial things. I go on. My own father is locked up right now. My own mother died on the station because they wouldn't call down here for medical assistance. Even when some of the other Enzorians up there said she could be saved. This card should contain footage from all of these surveillance cameras they use to monitor us every second of every day, even in our bedrooms. And I just want you to see it. If you can watch this and tell me it's what you want, fine. But I don't think it is. I've heard stories about you, and I'd like to think they're true. At last, this gets a clearer reaction. Stories? He says. Watch the footage. I reply. No games! The Emperor roars, and wow, he really does roar it. You think you can come down here and tell me what to do? Come down here and tease information? No. You tell me your stories, Chad Mitchell because your station commanders have told me some stories of their own since you diverted your mission's course, and I'm running out of patience. Chad Mitchell, I say. That's right, and this is Joshua Mitchell, my father. He's in a cage as we speak, for trying to expose what they're doing up there, and you're the only one who can do anything about it. While I'm saying this, I reach back to my waistband and pull out the photograph Dad dropped for me in the control room. I hold it in my right hand, while still grasping the storage card in my left. The hopefully important image is one of my father as a child, posing with an academic award, and the individual who presented it to him, Emperor Nebrion. The Emperor holds out a hand to receive the photograph. I step back and watch as he studies it. Almost immediately, his stern expression cracks. He then glances between me and the photograph, clearly noting the resemblance between how I look now and how my father looked at roughly the same age. He kept this, the Emperor says after several silent seconds. His faith in your goodness has gotten both of us through the past 17 years, I reply. He always said life under the commanders wouldn't be forever, and that one day the purpose of the stations would become clear. That one day the test would be over, or new commanders would come in, or whatever hopeful idea might make sense. He always told me not to hate the Anzorians as a race, 
because those two are no more reflective of your kind as a whole than bacteria are reflective of all life forms. Instead of replying to me, the emperor says something in his own native tongue. Everyone else quickly disperses. You come with me, he says, firmly delivering an order I'm happy to hear as he gestures with his head towards the storage card I'm still holding. I'll watch. Chapter 12 The Emperor, along with seven burly aliens who I figure must be non-uniformed security guards, guides me towards a palace that dwarfs anything I could ever have imagined. It's not just the size, either. There are beautiful trees dotted around the grounds, like nothing I've even seen in pictures. Inside, it feels like my jaw drops an extra inch with every door I pass through. The count is four when we come to a stop in a room filled with screens. It's not as dingy as the control room on the station, though, with a giant window looking out to a lush landscape beyond the fortress walls. I'll be honest, I'm mesmerized by this even as the Emperor and his helpers work to get the storage card set up with their own screens. It makes sense that it works, since it's all their technology, but I'm nevertheless relieved when I hear them tell me it's ready. I tear my eyes from the window and towards the main screen. How far does this data go back? I ask. The Emperor passes the question along in his own language. Clearly, the aliens who don't interact with humans can't verbally interact with humans. Again, this makes sense when I think about it, given how much effort it would take them to learn a language they'd never be likely to use. All the way. He passes back to me a few seconds later, translating the answer in the opposite direction. Years, back to when the system was installed. I try to think of the most egregious abuses of power I can, so the Emperor can see, but the first thing I think to look at is a view of the prison cells on any given day. Like the Emperor, this is going to be the first time I see the cells with my own eyes too, and when I do, I can't even look. A few minutes ago, I said the commanders have been treating us like animals. Now that I've seen this, I take that back. Only the most depraved of the depraved would put an animal in conditions like the ones I've caught sight of for a brief second. And trust me when I say that I'll be doing you a favor to spare the details. Enough, the Emperor says. He turns to me again and I expect him to ask for another example. But no. A lot of people are in your debt, Chad Mitchell, he says, and all of us Anzorians. These abuses of power are not reflective of our kind, and those who have inflicted it all upon yours will pay a high price. Wow. When he said he'd seen enough of the cells, he meant he'd seen enough of everything. I will deliver an unambiguous message to Exelon B, that your station commanders are hereby stripped of their authority. He adds, Every other Enzorian ultimately answers to me, as do the commanders, and I will issue an order for their detention. I will join you in your return journey to handle this myself. What has been done cannot be undone, but what can be rectified will be rectified today. How glad I am that my dad had the presence of mind to drop that photograph before Boron dragged him away. How glad I am that the storage card survived the landing. And how glad I am that Emperor Nebrion really is the reasonable leader my dad recalls fondly from his youth. The time to celebrate will be the moment when my dad is standing in front of me unharmed, 
but at least I can exhale. Things didn't exactly go to plan with that whole being shot from the sky episode, but I've done what I came here to do. And best of all, the Emperor is coming back with me to do what has to be done. Chapter 13 Taking off from the ground does require a vertical launch, unlike my departure from the station, but we don't have to wait around. Everything is ready by the time we reach the nearby launch site, which takes less time than the hour-long journey we're about to take back to the station. I say back to the station, but I've no reason to think the Emperor has ever been. In the hour we'll have on board a comfortably larger craft that I'm glad someone else is flying, I hope to have some time to get answers to the big questions I've always had. We're barely off the ground when I ask the first. Why did you put them in charge? My dad remembers you being nice, but he said that Sturjo and Boron always had a mean streak, even way back then. Nothing compared to now, but enough that everyone hoped they wouldn't be sent to their station. The Emperor seems taken aback by this. They were two of our first four choices, as I recall, let alone our first sixteen. Their records were exemplary, I'll admit. We didn't ask for human input, but we picked who we thought were the best candidates. For what? I push, getting to the next question and maybe the biggest of all. What's the point in all of this? Why did you first bring humans to your world? And why did you build these stations to house us? Emperor Nebrion doesn't say anything for several seconds. We split the human population into eight equal groups to maximize the chance of at least one group surviving the waiting period. If everyone was in one spot and something went wrong, all would have been lost. We had never created stations of this kind for this purpose, and the construction timescales were very tight. Think of it as putting our eggs in various baskets, as your people like to say down here in the original base. Survive the waiting period? I ask, fixating on something from the early part of his thorough reply. What waiting period? The Emperor tips his head back. Oh, of course. I suppose I didn't answer that part. Chad, Anzoria is not our planet. We are Anzorians, as you call us in nothing but name. I have lived here to oversee a challenging task for several decades, but this is not truly my home. We brought humans here, as many as we could at the time, because your planet was about to be destroyed by a cometary impact. We brought your ancestors to Anzoria because it was the most Earth-like planet within reach, other than our own. We had no means of interspecies communication with your kind back then, so our arrival on Earth was not well received. We couldn't cooperate as we might have liked. We couldn't recruit your planetary scientists, for example. So we simply took who we could before the heaven weaponry rained upon us. I can hardly believe what I'm hearing. They didn't invade us. They didn't conquer us. They went to Earth to save as many of us as they could. They... they rescued us. The waiting period I spoke of has been the wait for Enzoria to become suitable for human life. He continues. Through extensive environmental engineering, we have reached a point where... As you experienced, a human can breathe the air and feel at home on the Anzorian surface. 
So why are we still on the stations? I ask. As is becoming a habit, the Emperor hesitates. Well, Chad, reports from every station suggest that the human populations have grown accustomed to life in relative confinement, and under the control and guidance of your various pairs of commanders. There was a time when we believed that confining people to their stations without major revolt would be the hard part, but now we believe coaxing you out to the uncertain open world may be more challenging after all. We have no intention of sticking around to rule over you once the exodus from the stations begins. What I am lacking are reports of humans seeking self-determination of the kind that's going to be necessary. We have tried to do the right thing at every stage, but it seems that we may have overestimated your kind's drive for freedom. To me, this doesn't seem fair. I can only speak for Exelon B, I say. Where Sturjo and Boron created the situation of everyone being locked down in a small space and having to follow all of the rules they set. That messes with our psychology, but it's not irreversible. People are demoralized after so long with all of these restrictions, and it's literally the only life a lot of us have known. But think about that. It's the only life I've ever known. And here I am giving it up for a shot at freedom as soon as I saw an opening. I think if you offer people the chance to come down here, they'll bite your hand off to take it. They just don't know what's on the table. You are here. He muses. You did risk your life of servitude for a long-shot chance at a life of freedom and you did it coming from a lifetime spent within what must be the most demoralizing social structure on any of our stations. I nod firmly. But I'm no one special. I was lucky enough to be given a spacecraft and have the chance to win the trust of the commanders. A lot of others would have seized a chance like that too. And even if things are more comfortable on the other stations, I'll bet people would still prefer a life on their own terms. At the very least, it's surely time for you to give them the option. For the rest of the journey, Emperor Nebrion doesn't say more than a few words to me. There's no indication at all that I've irked him or anything like that. He just starts speaking in his own language to a bunch of aliens with different voices. He finishes up just as we're about to dock on the station, where I really don't know what's going to be waiting for us. Were you calling the other station commanders to tell them what's happening? I ask. I was. The Emperor says. I will be visiting each station and directly inviting anyone who wishes to descend for a free life on the surface in a matter of weeks. We have constructed living areas, as you may have seen from above, and our recent administrators will get to work on final preparations. We will retain a presence for a reasonable adjustment period, myself included but this will be on equal terms. Wow, is all I can say. I was also making sure that everyone here has been made aware of what you've done today. He continues. You have not only brought Sturjo and Boron to account, Chad. You have also reignited the grander plan we were beginning to doubt. That of rehoming your kind on a new world of your own. You have shown us that the drive for freedom is innate and invincible. And for that, you will be recognized. Oh, I don't want to be in charge or anything like that, I say. 
for the first time, Emperor Nebrion lets out something that almost sounds like a laugh. Have no fear on that front. Societal structures and leadership roles will be for you all to work out amongst yourselves. We will remain to assist in the settling in period to ensure that sustainable food sources and such are firmly established. But beyond that, you will be free to develop whatever kind of world you collectively see fit. I'm so engaged in what he's telling me. It takes a few seconds for me to even notice that we've docked. I guess with this arrival being so much smoother than my crash landing on Anzoria, it hardly registers. What does register, though, is the sound wave of cheers that greets us inside as soon as the inner airlock is lifted. This time, wow isn't enough. Chapter 14 After the happy wall of sound, the next thing that hits me is the sight of our welcome committee. It seems like everyone on the station is here. I see Tammy and I see Carl, who are both smiling at me and have hopefully forgiven my behavior over recent days now that they know I was up to something good. Best of all, after just a few more seconds, I see Dad rushing to the front of the crowd. He comes all the way forward and hugs me, which hurts more than I let on due to that crash landing I was just talking about, but which I don't want to cut short. I knew you could do it, he says. I just knew. How much do you know? I ask. By this point, I realize that almost everyone else is now squarely looking at and listening to Emperor Nebrion. I literally couldn't care less whether they were cheering for him instead of me, like I admittedly thought they were at first, because like I've said all along, none of this has been about me. I'm the guy who got the chance to act and I'm grateful for that. I wouldn't say everyone would have done the same thing in my shoes, but a lot of us would have. The Emperor was right about the drive for freedom being an innate one that lives within us, even if that fire might burn hotter in some hearts than others. And if my fire is one of those hotter ones, I have my father to thank. The two of us are walking away to a quieter spot, and since the Emperor isn't talking into a microphone, we don't have to go too far to escape the loudest levels of commotion. We've all heard a lot already, Dad tells me. I know the commanders are locked up for the Emperor to deal with them. I know you crash-landed and climbed out of the craft like it was nothing. I know why they took the first humans from Earth, too. Because the Emperor told the rest of the aliens up here that it was time for us to find out. So you knew Anzoria isn't their world? I ask. He smiles the widest smile I've seen on his face in far too long and nods happily. I know I'm going to be packing my stuff for a one-way flight pretty damn soon. He beams. And I know it's all down to you. That's not true, but I appreciate the sentiment. Who knows? Maybe I just sped things along, or maybe I really was an important catalyst. Either way, Dad is right. We'll be packing for a new life before long. I think it's going to be a few weeks until they're totally ready for us to go down, I say. Weeks? He groans. Ah, well. A few hours ago it was eternity. 
so I guess I can suck up a few weeks. I laugh along with him. Oh, and in the meantime, I say. He turns to me as we walk further into the heart of the station. Away from the hubbub ball, probably be dealing with for a while once the emperor leaves and I become the focal point for people's attention. That's not going to be a hardship, but I do want this time to catch up with Dad. It's so long since we've been able to speak openly without fear of being spied on. In the meantime, what? He prods, impatient that I've left an idea hanging in the air. Well, I grin, you maybe should pack your stuff tonight after all. Because while we're waiting for the trip to Anzoria, I can only assume that two very luxurious bedrooms have just become available in the formerly restricted zone occupied by our recently deposed station commanders. I like the way you think, son. He beams, patting me on the back as we walk along the corridor. This place already feels a lot less oppressive without the specter of our recently deposed station commanders hanging over it, but it still doesn't feel like somewhere we should be satisfied to call a home, particularly having just set foot on a vast open world and having gazed out at some of its incredible landscapes. I know the kind of place we're meant for. The human spirit isn't meant to be confined like this, and especially not under the dictatorial control of power-hungry leaders like Sturjo and Boron. We're better off without them. Better off on our own. And that's exactly where we're going to be. With thanks to Emperor Nebriand and most of his kind's good nature, freedom is ours for the taking. And if the reception the Emperor and I received when we arrived a few minutes ago is anything to go by, everyone here is ready to grab that freedom with both hands. Humanity has a new home. And Zoria awaits, I think to myself with a smile. And the only limit on the world we can build is the limit of our imagination. Thank you for listening to Bound for Glory, written by Craig A. Falconer, narrated by Garrett Kiesel. Text copyright 2021 by Craig Falconer. Production copyright 2022 by Craig Falconer. All rights reserved.